So, welcome to Herbs for Health week three at the Concrete Gardens. Today we're going to make a milk infusion, a hot milk infusion of a flower. Now at this time of the year, it's kind of quite early spring still here in, in Glasgow. Um, we've got, there not, aren't that many flowers around. So the one that we're going to use is Berberis Darwinii. I'm going to get that on the pot before we start talking because we want to cook this for a good five, 10 minutes. So I'm using an oat milk. Um, you can use any kind of milk that you like. What we're trying to do is use something with fat in it. And the idea behind that is that we might get some different constituents out from the plants than if we use water. Um, it's also, a, so for flowers, I'm trying to maybe get some of those volatile components out that don't always come out as much in water. So I've measured out using the mug that I'm going to use. That's the easiest way to do that. And then I'm just going to pop just a few of these kind of really pretty little flowers in. Um, and then I'm just going to leave that to infuse for a little while and give it agitate it now and again because I don't want to burn the milk. So we're going to keep that going for five, ten minutes. So this is, these are from Berberis darwinii, which is Darwin's Burberry. Now the actual, medicinally you tend to use the root of this plant, but from a culinary point of view, the flowers, I've got a really lovely kind of citrusy taste and the, um, these will turn into little berries. You might have come across Barbary. It's used a lot in Iranian and cooking. Um, oh, this is getting quite hot. I'm just gonna take this off the heat for a wee minute. That's still. Well, already I'm starting to see the oranginess of the colors coming out into this. So the, the fruits are, yeah, cold Barbary, and you often find that powdered. That's something that you can kind of use in curries and things like that. Though in this particular species, the fruit is, I think, I think it's often referred to as being sort of insignificant, which seems to be a little bit mean, but you can make use of it. And it's something it's always interesting to try to like make use of plants that you have around you. It's used a lot in sort of municipal planting because it's, it grows quite quickly and it's quite a big thickety kind of plant. Um, but the actual, the kind of flower buds themselves, I've got a really citrusy tang to them. Um, they just, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very, very surprising. And one of the reasons that I wanted to use these today was they're very abundant. So I think it's good when you're using flowers to use something that's abundant because obviously each one of these little bunches of flowers that I take isn't going to become a berry. So the plant can't then use that to make the next generation of plants. So, um, so yeah, it's always good to kind of have a think about that. So if you were looking later on in the year, um, a really nice plant to use would be um, the rose hip roses. So obviously those are quite abundant. And what's really nice about them is that you can remove the petals after the central bit of the flower has been um, fertilized. So it's a kind of, it's just rose petals that you use. So if you look out for that, um, as you move later into the spring and the summer, the, if, if you can imagine the little petals coming off and there's a little central bit that will become the rose hip. If that's still bright yellow, just leave those petals. But if it's gone a kind of brownie color, that means that the plant's been fertilized and literally the petals are probably ready to fall off anyway. You should just barely have to touch them and they'll fall off. And that makes a really nice kind of um, rose milk drink. It's also something that you can, it'd be quite nice to use in baking or if you make things like blancmanges and stuff like that, you can kind of flavor your milk beforehand um, just to get that. But in this case, we're doing this as a little citrusy drink. So you can see the, the color of the milk has changed a little bit. It's got a slightly pinky orangey glow. I don't know if it'll pick up in, in the sunlight here, um, but that's just some of those volatile compounds and hopefully some of that citrusy flavor coming out from the, uh, the Burberry flowers. So I'm gonna just strain that into a cup and have a wee try. So, or probably not strain it too much. So there we go. Yeah, I knew some of it's gonna go in, all of it's gonna go in. <laughs> But I'm going to try that anyway. So see if we've see got that citrusiness to it. So I think that would be really, really nice just to drink if you like a kind of milky drink. But also I think that would be a really amazing thing um, to use for cooking. Anything that you would use milk in, particularly for sweet things. So that's our um, Barbarous Darwinii um, milk infusion. So this is our first session on making uh, kimchi using foraged alliums and brassicas or onions and mustards. And the first step that we have to do is to prepare our cabbage. So I've sliced like slightly less than a half of a head of cabbage. I've saved one of the outer leaves here. We're going to see how that gets used in one of the next later stages. Um, so saved on that and then I've 
um, finely, as finely as you can be bothered, chopped a head of cabbage. So what we're going to do is, I'm checking through if I see any like slightly big bits. I'm going to make them a little bit smaller. But what I've done is I've chopped this up finely, and that's for two reasons. One is to increase the surface area of the cabbage, because we're going to be adding salt to this to help it break down a little bit. And the more surface area there is, then the more, bre the more breakdown there will be. And then the other reason is for practicality at the other end of the process. We're going to be f um, cramming a lot of this cabbage into a jar later on. And the smaller the pieces, the individual pieces of cabbage are, the easier it is to kind of get them into the jar. And actually, even later in the process when you're eating it, the easier it is to get them out of the jar to eat them. So the first step is to weigh how much cabbage we have. So we're just going to get scales and put those on. And then I'm just going to pop on a very heavy bowl and zero that. Ah, I was thinking about it. So we need to weigh the cabbage because we want to know what, how much salt to put in with it. And for most fermentations and for this one as well, and here I've got another bit that's too big, so I'm just going to chop that as I go along. Um, we're using one to three percent salt. So for every 100 grams of chopped cabbage, either one to three grams of salt. Now there's a tendency when you're first doing this to maybe add more salt and you can end up with quite an overly salty mix. Um, but if that's what, it, it does make it easier when it comes to getting liquid out of the cabbage. So keep adding this. So we've got cabbage, so we're looking just over 300 grams. Oh, this is going to be almost 500 grams, I think. Pretty much bang on. So if you've got cabbage of about this size, then say two-fifths of the weight is maybe 500 grams. Um, if you're buying your cabbage somewhere and you don't have scales, you could always ask when you're buying it if they could weigh it, because generally most places that you are. So that's 524 grams of the um, cabbage. And then I'm going to zero that again when it thinks about it. And I'm going to get you some flaky salt for this, so the kind of like coarse salt. Um, lots of reasons for that. It's about the surface area of the salt as well, but if you use your kind of regular table pouring salt, and um, that often has other chemicals in it to stop it from clunking together, and those can pre prevent the salt from working and from being so good for fermentation. So if I've got 500 grams of cabbage, I want between 5 and 15 grams of salt. So I'm going to, so that 5 grams of salt, it's about a teaspoon, I would say. So I'm going to add, so that's about five, maybe six. So I'm going to aim for eight, so sort of in the middle. And then just a little bit more, and a little bit more. There we go. So that's probably about a teaspoon and a half. So next step is to really get in, to in round the cabbage and give it a good massage, get that salt in. So the easiest way to do that is with your hands. And you want to give just a really loud kind of squish and you should start to feel like relatively quickly that the cabbage is getting a little bit damp and whilst you're in here if you spot any big bits like i have just pop those out and give them a wee chop again because um, it's really hard it's really easy to miss bits of cabbage when you're chopping it so it's a sort of double thing the massaging with the salt does make sure you've got nice little bits of cabbage i'm just going to tear that bit and that bit so just keep, make sure you're getting that salt right in, in with all of the cabbage, the stuff at the bottom, give it that kind of squeeze and then turn over. And I can see with this, it's starting to, especially the outer leaves of the cabbage, which are a lot finer. Those are giving out really loads of water and just tear a few more wee bits about. So that's great. So that, so you can possibly see that actually the, the sort of mass, the size of this has gone down quite a bit because it's all kind of getting all gooey in, to, in with each other. So we're going to leave this to sit for about an hour so that all, the salt can work on the cabbage and more of the liquid can be absorbed out. And a way to help with that is to weight it, is to put something on top of it. So I'm going to take a bowl that's slightly smaller. So I'm just press that down myself and that goes down a fair bit. And then I'm going to do, the easiest way to make a weight for yourself is to get an empty jar and add water to it because that then becomes quite heavy. So weigh this and then I'm going to cover that with the, cover it with, with something like your chopping board like this. And then you can place a couple, if you feel like that, that's not heavy enough, you can place a couple of books on top of that and then just drape over a tea towel or something similar. And that will just keep everything covered, keep flies and things like that out, but also is going to kind of keep enough weight on it. So I'm going to set that aside to do that for a while. And whilst we wait for that, I'm going to make the kind of foraged element of this. 
So the forage element is using wild alliums, which are wild onions. Um, we've got a little separate video on that for you. So I've got wild garlic and I've also got a few flowered leek here. So I'm going to use the wild garlic for this one. So a bit, bit of a handful of it. This was picked yesterday and kept in the fridge, so it's not quite as fresh as you might want yours to be. So I'm just going to chop this up and put it in this little bowl here. So traditionally kimchi is made in Korea and it's made with regular garlic and with a lot of kind of spicy peppery things. So if you don't have any wild garlic, you could just use regular cultivated garlic and just crush a few cloves of that. The wild garlic has a slightly gentler taste, I suppose I would call it. Um, and it's really good for people who maybe do sometimes find that the um, onions and leeks are a bit much for them, but obviously check beforehand. So that's the garlicky element in the wild garlic. And then the kind of spicy peppery element, I'm going to use a, f a couple of different uh, wild mustards or brassicas. So the same family as um, the cabbage, but these are just wild versions. So this little one here is, um, its Latin name is cardamine pretensis. It's called lady's smock or cuckoo flower. Um, it's, so it's a, a nice little one. It's got these lovely little pinky purpley flowers. So I'm going to chop that up and put it in. And then I've got one that, another plant that's in the mustard family, but also has a garlickiness to it. It's actually called garlic mustard. So that's this one here. I'm going to add some of that in as well. So what we're doing is we're, tr we're trying to create a paste that c is going to go through the cabbage once the cabbage has been had the salt on it for a while. And the other element that I'm going to add, so I'm just going to give that a wee bit of a crush together, is some sea some dried seaweed so traditionally you would use fish um fish paste for this but to have a kind of uh, vegetarian vegan version i'm going to take some dried seaweed i'm going to pop that in a little bowl itself so maybe between a teaspoon and a tablespoon of that and this is all this is all going to get really quite um quite large and expand quite a lot and this is filtered water i have here i'm going to add some filtered water to it and then the two of these I'm just going to leave to sit on the side for a while whilst we wait for the cabbage to get ready. So that's our first part of making wild foraged kimchi. So this is the second stage of making our kimchi with wild foraged kind of flavourings. So we've had our, look at you see the setup here, little kind of snapshot. So we've got the cabbage that's had the um, salt put onto it and massaged in and that's got um, weights on top of it so that we can get a lot of the moisture out of that. Now, we're, we're doing this after, I think it was like two or three hours. You could just leave this overnight and actually you will get a lot more liquid coming out if you do that. So I might have to show you a cheats option as well if this doesn't have quite as much liquid in it as we need, but that's fine. So the book's on top for extra weight here. So I'm just to take those off. And then we've just covered it with this bit of hessian just to kind of stop any flies and things like that getting into it. And also you don't want any of the precious water that comes out to evaporate off. So I filled this jar with water. It's a really easy way to make a weight is to just fill a, a glass jar with water. And then that's on top of a little bowl that was in inside the larger bowl. So you possibly see this is, these bits of cabbage have attached to the smaller bowl because they're really quite wet. So there's definitely lots of moisture coming out there. So this is our kind of damp cabbage and you can kind of bash it about a little bit with a, a kind of spatula or a wooden spoon or something. You can get the kind of, I'm, I'm, I can hear quite a lot of moisture in here. Um, and then to flavour this, we're going to add stuff that we've prepared previously. So we had some seaweed, which was soaking in water. So that's, oh, got absolutely loads of that now. And that's got some of the forage stuff under it. And then we've got our foraged um, alliums and brassicas. So these two we just mix together. Now, strictly officially, this is in, if you were making proper kimchi, you would make this into a paste. But I'm just going to give it a wee bit of a mix. You're just wanting everything to kind of join together a little bit. You could blend this into a paste if you wanted to. You could um, bash it about with a pestle and mortar and make it more paste-like. But I'm going for the kind of slight, slightly rough and ready way with it. So we just mi we're going to mix this through the cabbage. So this is adding a little bit more moisture and as some of the foraged elements have got quite a lot of moisture in them as well, you'll tend to find that over time, so there's another stage after this, and you'll find that over time lots more moisture will be produced. So, so that's what this looks like. So you've got that all mixed in there. And then our next step 
is to put this into a large jar. So we already have a conveniently placed large jar here. So I'm just going to water some of the plants with the water that was in there. And then give this a little quick rinse out with my purified water, just in case any of the chemicals from the tap water are still in there. It's just going to give that another wee rinse. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and jam as much of this mix into that jar as we can and squeeze as much of the liquid out as is physically possible. So you can use your wooden spoon to help with this or your spatula. Um, if you have a kind of wooden potato masher, those are often a really good size and shape. So make sure I'm getting plenty of the cabbage that's gone to the bottom here. So what I'm going to do is I'll show you the principle of this and then I'll show you the practicality of it. So this is, so we would be putting all of the mix in here, but just to show you for time. So you've got this here and we would just want to press that down as much as you can, getting, getting some of the moisture out. And you can just get right in and use your hand. So you see how much. Okay. And then just going to bung some more of this in. And that's looking really moist, really loads of moisture in there. You can actually feel there's some water at the bottom of the, bot the bowl here. So just pressing that down. So that looked like a huge amount of cabbage and greens in this bowl, but actually and crush it down into this not particularly massive jar. If you end up misjudging and you've got too much, just do a second jar. That's really quite easy. But what you want is jars that you've got something else that will fit in the mouth of it. And I'll show you, I'll show you one, I, one I made earlier, just in a moment. So just pressing this down, and pressing and pressing and pressing. And I can see the moisture is coming right up here. So, so, that's great, that's gone really well there. So, you can hear quite how damp that is. So if you're a wee bit short on moisture, and you're thinking there's maybe not quite enough in that, you can add a little, a tight, a little more sprinkle of salt and a little more um, purified water to get that up to the level. But this one with a bit of forcing is going to be absolutely fine. It's near, nearly upright all the way. So this is a jar that we've been using earlier to make some other things. So place this in here and use that to press. And if you can get it so that the water level is over the vegetables, then you're, you're absolutely flying. So I've noticed I've got a couple of little bits of vegetables that are up the top there. So just making sure, because so, any vegetables that end up above the surface of the water will probably go mouldy, so that's an issue. So we press that down, and when you feel that you've got enough, so you can see with this, what you do is you get, yourself, get a piece of material, place it over the top, and then put an elastic band over there, and that keeps that at this kind of lowered height. And I can show you, I kind of, here's one I've made earlier. Oh, and also forgot to say, if you want to, you can also place the spare cabbage leaf, which I conveniently left there for myself to remember. Um, so you can place this inside. And what that does is that further protects. So what will happen is eventually the water will go up over that, but that's just perfect. Uh, fortunately, now it doesn't fit. So I'm going to give the cabbage leaf a bit of a trim because that was such a perfect fit. It doesn't fit with an extra bit of cabbage leaf. So the idea of this is just to prevent anything going mouldy and to keep all that under there. So there you can see that's actually starting to come up over the cabbage leaf already. So everything's going to be nice and secure there. So cover that. I would leave it for like maybe, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. See, see what it's like after a week. So I've got one that I made before and you can see the setup. So this is a very elderly muslin that's seen better days. Now my advice always when you're doing something like this is to place it in a kind of on a saucer or something with a bit of a lip because sometimes the liquid spills over the top. So this, as you can see, I've got the muslin with the elastic band, which often gets caught on this. And you can see how much of this water level was way down whenever we first start, whenever I first started about a week ago. But now I've got absolutely loose. So I've got this here, and then I've got my cabbage leaf. 
So, oh, I actually did one and a half cabbage leaves, that's why it's like that. So, like that. And then in here I've got my fermented kimchi, so I'm just going to try a little bit. So that is very, very tasty. I should still be really crunchy. The idea with this is that you were preserving the integrity of the kimchi. So it should still be good and crunchy. Um, and that's and you can also use this liquid and dressings. So what I would do with this one, because there's not so much of it in the jar, I'd probably transfer this into one of the smaller jars. So it might be even fits in this one. So transfer this into one or even two smaller jars. Try to keep the liquid level about the same. So kind of proportionally of liquid in them. And then I'll keep this in the fridge and eat this as a kind of side with um, with salads or I tend to just have like a little bit of kimchi with pretty much every meal so that's how I do that um, so yeah that's your wild forage kimchi so if you leave yours to sit for a week maybe a little longer try it after that and see you should get like a little fizziness to it um, that, and you start to kind of get to recognise when that's coming if you make it a few times and you can also just l try it with other ingredients and try different variations on it but yeah the wild forage kimchi So we're going to look at making a fermented drink with some seasonal flowers. So it, you can make this with any flowers that you like. One of the important things about it is not to wash them because we're fermenting this using the natural yeast from the flower. So you probably want something with a relatively strong scent and flavour, but also something that grows on a shrub or in a tree is quite good because you're not having to worry about kind of cleaning them. So the, what I am using is these which are Berberis darwinii flower buds. Now these have a lovely kind of citrusy taste to them um, and just picked these this morning so they should still have, it is best if you're picking flowers to use them for especially for fermenting is to pick them early in the day um, ideally on a sunny morning if you can get one um, you want the plant to be producing lots of those um, volatile oils that make the scent and the flavour but also you want to kind of get in there before all the insects have a chance to take the, the kind of pollen and some of that some of that scent and some of that nectar. Um, some plants reproduce nectar all day but not all do so you want to try and get it early on a sunny morning to pick your flowers. So this is a really simple one I'm going to just be adding purified water so this is water that's been so you can either buy, um, buy bottled water or which isn't what this is this is a refill or you can um, use a, black, a charcoal filter or you can just boil tap water on the stove with the lid off so you're kind of boiling off a lot of the um, the kind of things in there that will inhibit fermentation and what you've got to make sure to do after that is make sure that you cool it um, to kind of room temperature at least or cool it completely if that's easier um, because you don't want to be adding any heat we're not cooking these flowers um, and if we did cook them it would impede the fermentation so I'm going to take for this size of a jar a good few sprinkles of the flowers I want to get plenty of those natural yeasts in so I would say that looks about right and I'm also going to add for flavour what were some frozen bilberries but which have unfrozen a bit um, so this adds a little bit little bit of additional sugar and just obviously adds quite a lot of really nice flavour the amounts for this are really just go go with what feels okay if you want to say like a two tablespoons of the flowers and a tablespoon of frozen um, berries or frozen fruits that sounds about right in this little small jar like this there we go and I'm also going to add a little bit of honey so I would say about a tablespoon of honey per litre of fluid so this is probably around 400 mils so we're going to do about half a tablespoon on this lolly stick let's let that run off in there that's so I guess a couple of lolly sticks worth. And another thing that you can do with seasonal flowers is actually just put them directly in honey to make an infused honey. So we could do that with the, the Berberis as well. And that'll be ready, to, it'll be ready to use pretty much immediately. This honey's nice and warm because it's been sitting in the sun. Um, and the taste from the flowers will infuse out nicely into that. So the sorts of things that you could maybe use for this at other times of the year are elderflowers or rose from the rose hip you probably don't want to use cultivated roses as there's often they have pesticides on them but if you've grown your own and you know that you don't have any pesticides on them or any kind of chemicals then you could do that and then what we do is simply pour over and i've got really sticky hands of course gently pour over 
your purified water so that you're just starting to soak in there to the flowers and obviously already the blueberry is coming out there so I'm going to have just enough water that's good so pop on the lids this is another little double lid so we're going to do what we often do with this sort of thing I'm going to invert it just to check that everything's kind of been covered and well absorbed I'm just going to check that's there and usually freeze up a little bit more space for a little bit more water but actually there's not a lot of space there so you want to invert this um for the f for the first kind of couple of days give it a bit of a shake because you'll notice your flowers are kind of tending to float to the top and we don't want them to to the kind of go moldy or anything like that and then after so when did i make this so i've got what i've got a here's one i made earlier so this i made i think three days ago so in this example you put the lid on tight for something like this to ferment but that means that you're going to need to do what's referred to as burping it so once you see little bubbles start to form which you can just about see on here if i shake it up you can see it a little bit more you want to open it up so that, to let some of the gases out so maybe you're going to hear this i don't know no didn't make too much noise um but yeah so this is the you can see there's a little bit of a fizz on this so i'm gonna taste this today and for the next few days and when i think it's fizzy enough and i like the kind of fermented taste of it i'll decant that into bottles and keep those in the fridge so this is a flowering currant and raspberry it's a slightly different recipe um so i would say from like day to four to seven days is probably how long it'll take for it to get nice and fizzy and um, you will find that it's probably happiest if it's somewhere where the temperature doesn't fluctuate too much so probably although the temptation often would be to put something like this on a sunny windowsill actually it's probably happiest somewhere which is warm but not hot and which stays about the same temperature all the time and then you're getting sort of your fizzy fermented you're getting the flavor of your wildflowers but you're also getting that fermented um element that's really good for your gut so that's our um darwin's barberry and bilberry or blueberry um, fermented drink mm -hmm.